A quick disclaimer that this episode comes in two parts. This is part one, and part two is available to listen to right now. This is the end of part one. Part two is available to listen to right now. Hello listeners, and welcome to this week's episode of The Cult Fault. I'm your speaker Casey, and we are going to be revisiting a subject today that has been covered before on the show, but from a new perspective. Before we get started, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to my newest patron, Alexander. Thank you for joining the Patreon group, for supporting the show, and for allowing me to continue releasing weekly content. I really hope you enjoy going back through the exclusive episodes, the ad-free content, and access to other special perks included in being a sponsor of the show. Because of the incredible support from the patrons and sponsors, I am talking to you today with a brand new microphone. I hope you can tell the difference in audio quality. I always have a backlog of around six or so episodes, so hopefully in a few weeks' time there should be noticeable difference in the audio quality of the interviews that I conduct too. I won't take up too much time discussing CrimeCon UK happening in June 11th and 12th in London, but you can visit crimecon.co.uk and use the code CULT at the checkout for 10% off today. The Ally Awards are still open and the Cult Vault merch shop has new things added all the time at cultvaultpodcast.com. And you can support the show on Patreon for as little as £1 a month at patreon.com forward slash the cult vault. But now, I am so honoured to bring to you Esther Friedman. Hi Esther and thank you so much for joining me on the show today. We are going to be covering something that we have looked into before but this time from a female perspective and also from another sect of the same group. We are also going to be discussing your memoir on this episode which I have been privileged enough to read ahead of time. Would you like to start by introducing yourself to the listeners? Sure. Um, Casey, let me first thank you for having me on your show, your fantastic show. Um, I'm, my name is Esther Friedman, and um, I live out, a little bit outside of Boston. And um, to introduce myself, I guess I will, up front I'm going to say I'm an ex-cult member. Um, I'm also an expressive arts therapist, um, and I do work with ex-members, you know, as well as other people struggling with other things, but definitely a good portion of my um, practice is ex-members right now. Um, and um, I'm a songwriter, and um, I believe in the healing of healing quality of the arts, I'll put it that way. Um, it's kind of my, my mission these days. <laughs> I think that's a great mission to have, and it's funny the amount of people we have come through the show that have an interest or adeptness for creativity and for the arts, yeah. uh, which I think uh, maybe speaks to something and I will talk more about some of the coined terms in your book that that I kind of feel fit into that but um expressive art therapist what sorts of things might we see or encounter if we would go to you for for expressive art therapy well let me um let me explain a little bit that you know, using the arts and therapy is typically uh, a good medium to work with people who, for example, have developmental disabilities or brain injuries. That's kind of where I started, elders, you know, dementia clients, Um, because they, you know, they're either losing their grasp on language or they never had it. So now that I'm not doing so much of that, I don't use the expressive arts as much with my clients, but Occasionally, we'll do writing exercises, and usually it's, you know, it's free form, just let her, let her rip, you know. I do not want you to censor you kind of writing. I'm going to set a timer. We're going to pick a topic, you know, um, because I feel like um, this kind of speaks to some of your questions, you know, about my writing process, but part, uh, in large part, my healing was just that I gave a lot of confusion and hurt and anger a landing pad, you know. I just, I just poured it all out somewhere and it wasn't just existing inside of me. And then I could step back and look at it and share it with other people and realize just how bad shit my experience had been. May I swear on this? On this yeah, I always say it's your story and you tell it however you want. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I am always really excited when a client wants to use the arts or writing. And it's very, for me, like you talked about being um, people centered, you know, not everyone's into it, <laughs> you know, but it, it's a really wonderful way to kind of not be carrying around a lot of confusion. It's, you know, all mm -hmm. you need is a, um, a laptop or a notebook or a bunch of colored pencils in a sketch pad, you know, um, and you've got your own way of processing, you know, these very bizarre <laughs> experiences so. that speaks to me so much I feel like I'm in my element when I'm walking around a stationary shop and I can't use half the stuff that's in there because I'm not particularly good at drawing um and my handwriting's not very neat because I'm left-handed so I tend to just smudge the ink as I write <laughs> and so I look at all the things and, and the potential for all the stationary but I can't quite put it into practice Maybe it's because I look at it and see what 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 it could be in the hands of of somebody that that has the, the right talent or the right skills. I don't know, but um, you know, I some... think honestly, when it comes to that to therapy as process, therapeutic process, it's almost better to not think you have any talent and just be like, All right, I'm just gonna let it rip. You know, it could be ugly. It could be real, the worst thing ever. Who cares? You know, <laughs> and I, maybe there there isn't enough of 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 our own thoughts and feelings that are uncensored these days um or, or or any days uh for that for that matter you know I don't know other than drama classes when I was in school the last time I was told to just write for five minutes without stopping whatever comes into my my mind and then to pull inspiration from from whatever I'd I'd written and turn that into some kind of um performance piece um I, I I can see the cathartic qualities of, of that for uh somebody that's not a survivor of a high demand group but then when you apply it to somebody that that has trauma and has experiences inside themselves that sort of manifest with nowhere for them to go uh -huh. to just have that ability of, of writing it down on paper or whatever creative art form works for you is it's definitely something that I am an advocate for and and would encourage when it comes to healing processes um from all manner of experiences yeah. that, that we encounter in life and and it kind of reminds me of, of some ex conversations that I've had with Nicola Ranson who came on the show to talk about her memoir a slice of orange about her time following the guru Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh and it also reminds me of uh, talking to the author Ronit Plank who talked to me about her mother going <laughs> to follow the guru Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh um, and how important it is to have all of this art in our life and now I get to talk to you about it and your experiences um, and also a lot of the time how these creative personalities are thwarted by these experiences that people have in their lives and and how the creative part of them is is often squashed or or I you know Casey can I speak to that for a second absolutely um you know we'll we'll probably talk about this more later because you had asked me some questions about my writing process but I lost my ability to write when I was in this group you know, it, I, it sucked me dry. And, you know, there, there were times in the group when it was okay for me to be an artist and most of the time not, right? Because as per usual, all these groups are the same, you know, the demands increase and then you're running around talking to people that you don't know because <laughs> you're trying to recruit them, <laughs> even though you don't want to. Nobody fucking wanted to recruit anyone, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> Everyone hated it, you know, but um, you feel like you have to. And, um, these groups, I think it's probably true for every high demand cult that if you go in there, you know, with some proclivity, a passion for the arts, it's going to get hijacked or squashed or taken away from you. And I think there is nothing more cathartic and empowering than going, fuck that. <laughs> I'm taking my voice back, you know. Mm -hmm. I so. think there was a, there was an interview that came out recently uh of, from somebody who was in a high demand religious group who really enjoyed music songwriting and playing instruments but felt like he had to stay away from music for so long because it was such a a, a trigger for him 
in reliving the spiritual trauma that, that he had experienced during his time in this group and has recently just started taking up uh, music lessons again and getting back into writing music and playing music and that it just like gives me goosebumps to think yeah. about people taking ownership back over the from the things that, that they really enjoy and love in life um, and it doesn't have to necessarily be writing it's not for everybody we've talked on the show before about different ways that people may be able to use a creative outlet or adopt one if if, if they don't feel like they have one already and uh, I, I know from my experience of, of working on uh, in a in a housing unit with dementia patients that we would have these um newspaper clippings from the the decade where the patients were kind of in their 20s and we would play music from that era as well and some of the reactions from from uh, each individual from just listening to that music or watching um football matches on the tv from from the from, from the yeah. decade where they would have been sort of in their 20s and 30s yeah. the reaction is just incredible um so it, it, that in itself shows the power of of music of entertainment of the arts sure. um right and i mean we could talk about this all day um it could be its own rabbit hole for sure you yeah know? definitely um yeah. but what is the topic that we are going to be revisiting today <laughs> okay so um <laughs> so we are revisiting um my experience you know, in this very, very secretive cult, very surreptitious, very underhanded, um, and what I learned from it, you know, and then the subsequent cult busting mission and obsession, which may or may not be too healthy, but it is what it is, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so. and another thing I think we've said on the show before is that healing journeys start, but they don't really ever end. So that that yeah. is a nice um like a nice caveat for that I think mm -hmm. and and the topic specific to today's episode is going to be something that I spoke about a few weeks back with Spencer Schneider when I talked to him about his experiences in a group called school um which I say with my air quotes um yes. because it didn't really have a name because it wasn't um supposed to be named or known by anybody that's supposed to be it was the invisible world <laughs> And so school is the topic, but today we get to understand a bit more about school from your perspective um, and your experiences that were separate to Spencer's because he was based in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you were not. I was not. <laughs> so, <laughs> so as you know, um, I, oh, where to start? First of all, I did not know there was another branch in New York. I had no idea until oh. I left. That's how secretive it is. Until you left? I had no idea until I left. None. Do you think, <laughs> have you spoken to the to any of the ex-New York members about whether they knew if you were a, a, a functioning group outside of New York? You know, I have not asked that specific question, but it really would be worth asking. My my guess is that the longer term members, the people deeper into the inner circles probably did. But, you know, there were so many little groups, little, you know, secretive new recruit groups. They don't know. You don't know what you're in. OK, so when I did find out about New York and of course, New York is where the big, you know, the real teacher Sharon was, I started referring to it as corporate headquarters and Boston as the poor cousin, <laughs> because I did learn from someone who had been in both the New York and the Boston branch that New York looked down upon Boston, <laughs> which I think is kind of funny now. <laughs> so there's, there's, there's us versus them in terms of With, people yeah, that don't know about school and people that do. And yeah. then there's the us versus them in, in the hierarchy that you explored in, extremely in depth in your writing. And then there's even further than that. It's, oh, there's a branch in, in Boston and a branch in Manhattan. Yes. Yes. Um, so, um, <laughs> yes, yeah, the, the us versus them is kind of endless. But do you know that when you're in a cult, you don't even know you're in a cult? <laughs> You know, everything's couched as, you know, support and help and, 
you know, we're, we're helping you evolve and remember yourself and all that BS. So, And can you give us a bit of background information on this group? Do you have, I know that there it's, it's so secretive. Um, and I even said to Spencer in his interview, if you were to go up to somebody and say to them, I was part of a secret school, but, um, there's no fixed address. There's no, there's no um, paper trail of, of, of fixed name. There's, there's no um, record of, of, of members and nobody would be able to tell you that they attended school because nobody spoke about it. And if you saw each other in the streets, you pretended that you didn't know each other. I said, I said to him, if you were to go up to somebody that wasn't familiar with cult-like methods of control and tell them that, they would say, no, I don't believe you. That sounds like you're making it up. But now that there's actual records online and other ex-members have come forward to corroborate the information and and now we know, as, as I also said to Spencer on Sharon's Wikipedia page, it says that she was a cult leader, which it doesn't usually, <laughs> usually it will say like business entrepreneur um, or religious, <laughs> religious leader. Um, it doesn't usually just say outright cult leader. So I was surprised when I saw that. And, I, and then I thought maybe it, it's an ex-member that, 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 edited the wikipedia page to say that um i'm sure uh, somebody listening will know the answer to that question but um is there anything that you can tell us uh, on background information uh, dates or rough times that the the group started you know, um, i can give you a really really rough history and again this is all stuff i learned after <laughs> okay um i had no idea Okay, this group, it, it couched itself as a secret esoteric mystery school, you know, ancient, right? The truth is, um, this sociopathic I'm, guy who thought of himself as a playwright <laughs> started it in the late 60s, 70s in San Francisco, you know, the groovy, <laughs> you know, 60s and 70s. Um, and there, it had, there were set, several iterations back then, you know, 30, 40 years ago, right? One of which was called the Theater of All Possibilities, which um, became, I know this because there are some articles that I can share with you, became very well known for like, you know, they're putting on these plays and people, I guess, were running around selling tickets and they had quotas to meet. So the people who weren't part of the theater were like, why are these people so aggressive? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, there was all kinds of, you know, allegations of physical abuse, neglect of children, sexual abuse um, that came out of that group. And eventually San Francisco shut it down. Okay. And the group migrated across the country i you know what happened during that time i don't know again this is very rough but you know ended up in new york city somehow floated out to boston to start out you know uh, the the satellite branch <laughs> so you know so it has this secret mystery school or theater whatever it you know whatever iteration whatever manifestation it morphs into it's it's existed since the late 60s it's easy to already start drawing comparisons between the work in school um and i don't mean that in the um in the cult language sense of work either because i know that that was one of the words that was used to explain what happened in school um yeah. i i mean sort of the work around um groups getting together and and it, in a way that reminded me when i when i first started learning about school in the way that early synanon developed uh, in in Santa Monica and they're not I don't think it's too far away from uh, San Francisco in in the grand okay. scheme of, of of the US um and to think that they were kind of around about the same time yeah. but then you could talk about so many different things that existed in that period of time I've just done a piece on 
Anton LaVey in the Church of Satan, which was also in San Francisco. And you could, you know, know with him, him in the Black House and, you know, just down the road, Charles Manson had an apartment. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, they would all draw an influence from, from Scientology, which I'm sure we'll talk about um, a, a bit later on. Um, and they were all drawing influence from Alistair Crowley, who existed decades before, but was also interested in mysticism and esoteric societies, which yeah. kind of leads us nicely into my next question. Um, you you have already mentioned um, esoteric societies and, 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 and this being a, a secret group. Uh-huh. There are so many people in this world that search for secret societies uh, with, an, with the aim to join them. Um, as part of the kind of allure, the secrecism, the secrecy is part of the appeal, or maybe it's because they uh, study certain types of, of magic that are in keeping with secret societies. Do you feel like secret societies have an appeal because the fact that they are hidden and you're being invited into something that, that, that is so, so secretive and, and special? I think it's very seductive. You know, I mean, you get this sense of superiority and, uh, you know, for me, you know, at the time, let's, when I, when I stumbled into this life was not going so well, you know, and suddenly not only are these people interested in me, but they think I'm special. (laughs) You know, when I, when I met the grand poobah of Boston, Robert, he said, you know, we don't just invite anybody into this group. (laughs) know which should have been a red flag but at the time I was not quite as well versed in you know the the you know the tactics of cults um but you know it was kind of like oh wow they see something in me you know I I they must see something special in me (laughs) right I suppose that's a difficult question to 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 answer it in that sense though because to answer that question, you've had to jump for- forward to talk about how you were actually invited to the group, but that didn't happen for a long time. There was actually yeah. a very prolonged systematic approach yeah. to you, you being invited into the group. Yeah. So when I put in my questions to you, how did you join? I was like, huh, that's such a simple four letter question that has such a, a such a loaded uh, answer. So I yeah. didn't know if you wanted to kind of uh, talk the listeners through what your journey into an official invitation into this secret group looked like. You know what? I think this is really important because this is not the only group who uses such underhanded, <laughs> you know, surreptitious. Is that the word I want to? Like, I don't know. You know, it's. It's like you don't know, you don't have no idea what's going on. So um, I will happily walk the listeners through this. I'm at a grocery store, Whole Foods, and I, there's I'm waiting in line, and there's a family behind me, mom, dad, two kids, right? And um, I was, I was brooding about a breakup. You know, I'm getting ready to break up with my boyfriend. <laughs> Actually, the funny thing, Casey, is, and this is true, I was picking up provisions. I was like, we're going to have a summit. I'll buy, I'll bring some food. <laughs> so, and I was feeling sorry for myself. And, you know, there were other things not going right in my life, right? But the breakup was front and center. I was 41, you know. Um, so I wasn't young. And I was like, I just can't get my shit together. I don't know what to do. Well, right. I mean, it it feels pretty reflective to be able to go to the grocery store and say, I'm going to buy us some things so that we can sit down and do this amicably, uh, amicably and, and properly o- yes. over, over some good snacks. Yes, <laughs> that was the idea anyway. Um, and um, the mom, um, her name is Lisa, and I do not mind using her name because she's still recruiting um, turned to her daughter, and I'm going to guess the daughter was maybe seven or eight. I didn't really know, but, you know, pointed to a magazine and said, what do you think of that magazine cover? 
The daughter rolls her eyes, and then she turned to me and said, what do you think? And from that point on, I, I can tell you, I had cognitive dissonance from the fir very first conversation, because on the one hand, I was like, I'm in Boston. You know, people aren't that friendly here. <laughs> it's like, what does she want? And I maybe probably should have gone with that instinct, you know. But on the other hand, I was feeling sorry for myself. She engaged me in a conversation. I looked at the magazine. I, I am not lying. It was a picture of a Zen garden. I was like, oh, that looks awesome. And I told her so. <laughs> You know, oh, that looks awesome. And then she engaged me in conversation and her husband joined in and we were talking about, I mean, it happened really fast. By the way, there was a line of people behind us, you know, so people were waiting. The cashier's trying to ring up our items. We're talking about writing plays and being a songwriter and she's a painter and, you know, all over buying a bunch of food, you know, and then we walk out of the, um, the Whole Foods, and she said, um, I've really enjoyed talking to you. We should get together sometime. Let's exchange phone numbers. So we did. Except that she didn't give me a phone number. She gave me a voicemail service. <laughs> but she that's not something that. that you realized for a while. Yeah, I realized it when I started being trained to recruit people. <laughs> and I had to get a voicemail service. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That is. And that is such an important discussion that that, that that we need to have around the moment you realize that you were being asked to go out to do what Lisa had done to you in in Whole Foods um but at the time you think it's just her phone number she's just giving you her number so that you can phone her and say let's get together let's carry on let's pick up our our, our conversation yeah there's there's no way I would have ever suspected you know from the opening line of, um, you know, what do you think of that magazine to, you know, I've really enjoyed talking to you. Let's get together sometime that it was scripted. I mean, this is like, this was a, it's a strategy. They've do mapped you, it out. It was hot. Do you feel like Whole Foods was chosen specifically because a certain, a, a, a person with a certain, uh, level of income might shop there or or did she just no. happen to see somebody that she thought the script might might kind of be I think it's more the latter because you know because my experience of being trained it's like you go through your day but you kind of keep your antenna up right but Whole Foods is a really good place to meet someone who's you know kind of open to things that are different or you know maybe into you know um um, natural herbs or something, you know, like, so it's, it's a good place to meet someone who might be open to this crazy group, you know? Something uh, else that stuck out to me in that particular part of your book as well, when you were talking about how it, it just looked like a typical nuclear family, husband and wife with their children, Mm -hmm. it, it it reminded me of a true crime documentary I watched one time and I know that this we're not talking about serial killers when you're talking about Lisa Lisa is not a serial killer no. it just no. reminded me of there was one serial killer who used to lure vulnerable women into his vehicle because he had a child with him that wasn't his child but he told them it was his child and because the uh -huh. women had seen that there was a child in the car they thought well, there can't be anything wrong with this because he's a responsible parent that's taking care of his child. And so nothing could go wrong here if, if he has a minor in the car with him. And of course, that wasn't the case because horrible things happened. But I feel like the presence of a family unit with children involved, innocent children of a certain age, it, it gives off the, you know, safe vibes. The, right. the, the normal... approachable open vibes this is a yeah. family a, a lovely a lovely family unit who yeah. want to just chat to me in Whole Foods yeah they're just friendly normal family and you know when you think about that it's just different levels of predatory behavior right like... it, I just thought it was absolutely awful that she had included her child in that in that initial conversation with yeah. you to 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 uh, as the opening hook yeah. for, for, for you into this group um and I understand that 
Lisa has going ha- has been through her own systematic indoctrination into this group as well so that's a whole other conversation to talk about her um responsibility um and and she has probably also been pressured or encouraged by leadership to use her children as a way to speak to people or relate to to people got her rolling her eyes yeah mom's going at it oh fuck you know mom's doing it again (laughs) <laughs> that I bet her daughter is so used, you know, gotten so used to it, but just so annoyed by it, right? That would be my my thought. <laughs> Especially because after you um after you leave the car park, she she calls you a few times and leaves you voice messages, uh, and then eventually you decide to to call her back. So it's a lengthy process lengthy. as well that, that doesn't just end when you make that phone call, right? it continues for for months and months and months so it it kind of then you start to ask how many of these people have has the daughter met and how many times and uh you know if this if this is happening over such a lengthy process with each person that is successfully approached by Lisa um yeah that's a whole it'd be interesting to have a conversation with the daughter to see um (laughs) yeah you know what what the answers would be you have two little kids. I mean, think about how much time that would take away from you taking care of your children. <laughs> I just, I can't even think about how there could possibly be any time for anything other yeah. than what I already do. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, yeah, there's just a lot. Just in that scene alone, there's a lot to process, right? But she 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 does keep calling. She keeps calling, and it was over a course of time. And honestly, I I don't have a great memory for frame time frames as it is, but I was really not doing well at that point in my life, so it made it even harder. Um, but you know, she was persistent, and I was kind of you know not really calling her back, or I'd try, and I kept getting, of course, I kept getting voicemail, right, because she. <laughs> she wasn't giving me her phone number um and I wasn't that attached to it but she was very persistent and finally you know she called and I was home we started getting together like it wasn't like she sprung a group on me right away she she um what's the word fabricated a friendship oh it's so malicious when you word it that way that's what it was <laughs> and, yeah. and and do you I know that there are a few people that that you met within school that you had genuine connections with Mm -hmm. that you weren't always able to pursue in the way that perhaps felt natural to do so. But do you feel like there must have been times where Lisa recruited people that she genuinely felt that human connection with? I think so, because I I don't think she's you know, I don't think she's Machiavellian. And in fact, we had a lot of fun. You know, that's part of what was so confusing about it. I laughed a lot with her. Um, She was a very good listener. And that was something I needed at the time. She was kind. I remember one time we went to the Museum of Fine Arts and I, I don't know if I was having allergies or a cold, but I I was coughing a lot. And she was like, let me drive you home. You know, Um, you, you need some rest, you know, really nurturing, very sweet, caring, um, you know, so I think it's not that, you know, she's totally cold. I think she probably really believes in what she's doing. You know, I'm making your life better. I'm going to introduce you to this school. <laughs> and although it takes a, a, a long time for that conversation to happen, that there are a number of things that had happened in your life prior to you meeting Lisa that made you perhaps more open to pursuing a brand new friendship with a complete stranger in Whole Foods and I wondered if you could just kind of maybe list a few of what those things were so anybody that's listening um, if they have found themselves going through the same transitional things or if they know of, of a loved one who's going through them things that that make you particularly more susceptible or vulnerable if you were to come across somebody like Lisa? Well, um, this kind of gives me an opportunity to to talk about the book a little bit, um, which I'm calling the gentle souls revolution. And, you know, the concept of, well, who is a gentle soul? And um, this is something I came up with because, you know, 
I've just been wired a particular way my entire life. Empathetic, sensitive, creative, um, overthinker, you know, just, just constantly trying to understand things, especially human behavior, very idealistic, you know, and, you know, as someone who is wired that way, I've also been told for decades that I think too much, that I'm too sensitive, you know, that I need to toughen up, um, that I'm making a mountain out of a molehill. And you know what? None of that helped me. It just made me feel like there was something wrong with me. So I, I think I was particularly, um, especially at that time in my life where, you know, the breakup, I was really confused my, about my career. I felt like I had nothing. I really didn't have anything, honestly, <laughs> you know. Um, I had all these artistic dreams and aspirations that I was like, I can't get there. Everything's out of my reach. And I've been, you know, told all my life that empathy is like a problem, you know. Um, or, you know, I, I got a master's degree in expressive arts therapy, but all of the jobs are super low paying and I live in Boston and how am I going to make it here? You know? So I think that those of us who happen to be very empathetic and kind and compassionate and want to be helpful, get a lot of mixed messages. Those, what I think of as, strengths and gems and you know um gifts to the world right now especially right now because there's a lot of you know mean assholes running around you know taking center stage those things were pathologized and it made me very vulnerable to someone who was being kind to me and so you know this doesn't just happen with cults it happens with with abusive relationships right relationships with narcissists and narcissists is going to be like my radar's going off and there's one that's super you know kind and will be really understanding if I'm in a bad mood and you know I had to learn how to protect myself and that this was a tough lesson <laughs> and something that you wrote about in your book that I have been trying to express in some of these interviews for so long and mm -hmm. this always happens, and I, this is why I need to read more, because it happened so much when I was reading Jeffrey Wallace's work as well around the Jehovah's Witnesses and spiritual abuse. But there were so many times where he summarized things, and I was like, wow, that's a thought that I've been trying to formulate for so long. And you did mm -hmm. it in your work when you were talking about how um, Scientologists during recruitment don't just jump in straight with, the, the 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 bridge to total freedom because if somebody came up to you with that pitch you'd be like oh my goodness this is not <laughs> co coherent thinking this is not coherent right. speech um, right. I'm not sure what to make of what this person's telling me but it doesn't make sense and it can't be accurate because it's talking about things that aren't even relevant to planet earth so and the way that you word it in your book, it was just, I was reading it and I was like, that is exactly it. People don't just approach you with the 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 most um, bizarre and secretive parts of, of the groups that they're trying to bring you into. And I've often said on this show that Dianetics at a basic level is quite helpful in some life situations. If you just apply it to everyday situations, Yes. then it can be quite a helpful tool on the surface. But as soon as you start moving up those levels and applying it to things that become more funneled and insular and specific to the, the work that is expected of you to complete in that particular group, that's where it becomes impossible and problematic. And yeah. then it becomes your fault because it, it, if the work isn't working for you, then you're not doing the work. Um, <laughs> not trying hard enough even if yeah. every single minute of every single day whether you're sleeping or awake is dedicated to that yeah. work yeah and um, you know Casey I just want to say something about that um um about you know the things that work in the beginning when you're dealing with maybe more surface level problems become these prescriptions with no nuance you know there's no like consideration of context or personality or history 
you know it's just like well you you're not trying hard enough you know <laughs> this is not working <laughs> so and I guess that kind of in a way could come back to our conversation about the arts uh, at the start of the episode Um, when I was in school I really struggled with mathematics and I just couldn't I just couldn't um, I just couldn't get it and I and I used to get really quite anxious in school because I was so overwhelmed by the subject and I felt pressured to do well enough to get a certain grade in my in my exam so that I could go on to further education uh, my my partner who I'm with now actually has a maths degree and he always tries to teach me maths things and I and I just can't, I, it just panics me so much when he starts to, to do maths with me but he always says that I just never had the right teacher or I never had the right uh, learning method um, and I feel like perhaps people that are more in tune with with uh, creativity um have different ways of of learning and of working and that's why I uh, always feel like facilitation is easier for for people to learn in their own personal way over than just kind of teaching um one group of people where you know somebody says one plus one equals two and the class say one plus one equals two and they're kind of just repeating back what the teacher is saying to them um and that is another thing that that comes from these discussions that we have everybody is told to do the work in the same way everybody is told to follow the same handbook uh to the letter everybody is expected to do the same as each other and the 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 results should uh speak for themselves but that's again we're we're individuals and and you speak so much in your work about how there's no the 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 death to self you speak of a, a little bit and there's no opportunity for people to realize their individualism whether it's a group that they're born into or whether it's the one like we're talking about today where over you know a a systematic period of time you you have that individualism stripped away from you the individualism works against the group they don't want that you know the leadership does not want you to realize your you know individual strengths and weaknesses and passions and you know set personal boundaries you know and you know that this is why you know cults have to continually recruit because pe- people don't work that way <laughs> you know i mean after a while people are going to like me get sick of it and leave you know and some of the dif- the difficult parts of, in your book to read were the parts where you would approach leadership and tell them that you were struggling and they would kind of just slap a a, a, a plaster or band-aid as as you might say in America they they would just slap a band-aid on it and say um well it's your husband's fault for not minding his own business and that was the same response that you'd seen them give to so many other members who had come to them with problems and and worries um, and approach the leadership for some wisdom and some advice and just be given the same kind of, um, well, it's your it's your mum's fault or it's your husband's fault or your wife's fault or your child's fault. And, and that, again, humans don't work in that way. And it's not a one sentence fix fixes all problems for each individual. Uh, and, and this is more stuff that I'm sure we will talk about but of course when you are approached by Lisa she doesn't just come to you and say in Whole Foods hey do you want to come join my secret group because first of all it's supposed to remain a secret but secondly Scientologists don't just say hey have you heard about the bridge to freedom (laughs) how how many times do you think you saw Lisa before she introduced you to um to the person that that did officially invite you to to the school? You know, I'm going to guess between four and eight, and I'm going to guess that because that's the kind of prescribed, I mean, there's a system for this. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And I can remember at least four. Um, so, you know, it was over a course of maybe two and a half, three, four months of making plans, getting together, and I am not the only person on her list, right? that she's doing with this with, you know, calling and calling and calling, you know, meeting for coffee, 
you know, meeting at the MFA, going for a walk. And, you know, and she's also taking notes. That I did not know, right? I, I don't know that she's keeping a dossier. <laughs> I think you might have to, though. But just, just uh, if, if you're trying to juggle all of these people that you don't, have that, that you don't have genuine connections with, all of them, you, you might need to make notes. Just well, to... it's also required for recruiters of to course. do that. Yeah, which you know. is a whole other violation that, yes that that, that that we do need to discuss yeah I mean it's just a you know it's like another violation on top of another violation that as someone who had no education was very naive was feeling down on my luck I would never have suspected right just like I never suspected that the phone the phone um, number she gave me was a voicemail service that everybody was using, that everybody was phoning into. Right. All the other people that all the other recruiters had awesome. spoken to in grocery stores and museums or yeah. parking lots or call centers or doctor surgeries or wherever they've wherever. come across these people all calling into the same voicemail service. Well, they all had their own voicemail service. Right. Okay. So all the people that Lisa spoke to called her voicemail service. You know, it was a collection place, right? For her potential recruits. And did she answer the voicemails herself or was there somebody whose job that was to, to, to write those voicemails down and deliver those messages? I am gonna guess that that was all her. You know, because it was, I mean, again, I'm speaking from the experience that I had. I was supposed to get a voicemail service. And if I, if for my safety, not to give my phone number out, you know, allegedly. <laughs> so your own personal phone number. Right. They would say, you know what, they think this is getting a little confusing. So when I was, because we're jumping forward to when I started. Yes. Sorry. That's my fault. I do it all the time. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. But you know, when I'm being trained to, they didn't say recruit, right? They called it making new friends. <laughs> So when I was being trained to make new friends, they said, don't use your own phone number for your safety. Get a voicemail service. So everyone who was out making new friends paid for a voicemail service. And you you paid for the voicemail service out of your own money. Oh, yeah. Money. They weren't going to pay for it. <laughs> on top of the, the, the monthly... $350 monthly, yeah, tuition. Yeah. So... <laughs> I mean, honestly, Casey, sometimes when I talk about this, I'm like, is this my life? You know, <laughs> it's, it's like, I must be making this up. It sounds so fictional and crazy. That is but... So that reminds me of a, an interview that I had with Blanche when she came on the show to talk about her time in the Soka Gokai International uh, or SGI, where she talked about how when when she first started recruiting people years and years and years ago, for every person that you recruited, they had to sign up to uh, like a monthly newsletter um, or a monthly magazine subscription, and it cost money. So every time that somebody left or stopped paying that subscription, the original recruiter, it was then their job to pay that person's subscription. Wow. So you had to work so hard to make sure that the people that you recruited never left because otherwise you'd end up having more and more and more subscriptions to pay for, which kind of sounds like multi-level marketing, but also sounds like the unification church in a lot of ways, which I know you also mentioned in your book. Yeah. And it's, it's so much to think about because somebody that's not aware of the methodologies that are in place with these types of groups might just say we'll stop recruiting people and that is just not uh, something that is even comprehensible to the person that is in that recruiting process at that time so yeah. um I was so shocked when Blanche said that to me but this is kind of in keeping with that. You're already yeah. paying for your tuition, as you said in air quotes, yeah. and you're having to then pay for your own voicemail service to receive voicemails from to make new friends to bring potential to new friends. Yeah, yeah, essence friends. That's what we were called. <laughs> essence friends. After kind of four to eight ish 
um, meetings with Lisa over a period of two to three to four months, she eventually introduces you to a third person. And this uh, was another parallel uh, that I drew between your story and Spencer's because it, it happened much in the same way with him. Yeah. He was approached by somebody who said, come join this group. But uh-huh. he was not really in any of these transitional periods and not really experiencing anything that might make him more vulnerable. So he was quite, um, I would say, um, outspoken in his <laughs> response to that person, basically just saying like, no thanks, but uh-huh. then felt guilty about the way that he'd responded to that person yeah. and said to him, look, I'm willing to listen to what you have to say. And then yeah. after a while was introduced to a third person, much like you were. Yes, it's and it's exactly the same. You know, the the protocol in New York is the protocol that we use in Boston because I believe it was designed by a recruiter, someone who works as a recruiter in New York, like as a corporate recruiter, took the corporate recruiter, whatever, brought it to the cult, refined it for the cult, (laughs) and trotted it out to these two branches. How did that initial meeting go? Did you know that you were meeting another person or was that kind of sprung on you in the middle of like a coffee date with Lisa? No. um, So, (laughs) oh my gosh, it just makes me laugh when I talk about it. So here I am, you know, naive person, think I have a new friend. She's a little odd. She doesn't talk about herself that much, but she really likes me, makes me feel good, right? And one day we're talking and I said, I shit you not. I said to her, is this all there is to life? You know, I was feeling sorry for myself. And he paused and said, how would you like to meet other people who have the same types of questions? Something to that effect. Um, I have a group of friends, you know, we get together on Tuesdays and Thursdays. It sounded really casual. Um, you know, and I was like, okay, at this point I trusted her, right? She's, she's manufactured a friendship. I think I can trust her. She drove me home from the MFA when I was coughing, you know? (laughs) Um, and I was like, sure. You know, I'm picturing a potluck, right? At someone's house. Yeah. I mean, my friends get together weekly to play board games and, and, you know, if someone came to me and said, do you want to come and play board games? I'd probably bite their hand off. I'd be like, yes, please. Yes. (laughs) You know, you're feeling lonely. You know, someone's like, come meet my friends. I was like, great. And then she said the magic words, which again, red flag. You can't tell anyone about this. It's very private. You know, it's, it's private just for you. That's the, you know, that was the line they were trotting out back in the early 2000s. And then she said, you know, I want to introduce you to someone beforehand. And we planned to meet up. So we made plans. I I mean, I remember this vividly because honestly, Casey, this in 2006, the spring of Boston, it was constantly raining, like pouring torrents of rain. Okay. And so (laughs) we make a plan and we meet at a Pete's coffee in, um, in Brookline, which is a burb of Boston. Um, and it's pouring rain. And um, um, she, you know, she introduces me to Robert, who at the time I thought of as just another friend. She didn't say, you know, this guy is the leader of the group. <laughs> she, um, and um, I, I made a comment about the rain, you know, and um, again, red flag had a, any education or any savviness, his next, you know, comment would have sent me running for the hills. He said, um, it has been said that raindrops are angels' tears and that the angels are crying. (laughs) It's 
funny that you laugh about it now though and, and you you've laughed quite a lot through this interview so I guess that is one of your kind of uh, coping strategies is to just laugh about the whole thing I have to because it's I mean I'm in and I'm not trying to make light of it they you know they took advantage of me it was exploitative but it's also so so weird and bad shit when I talk about it I'm like and especially now, you know, looking back now with a lot more education, a lot more savviness, a lot more self-protective mechanisms, <laughs> I can't believe I fell for that, you know? But I, I also, I promise you, I'm not being hard on myself. I just, you know, realize how ill-prepared I was really to go out into the world and how I think there are a lot of people ill-prepared to go out into the world. There are a lot of people, I mean, most people that you meet are going to be kind people, right? They're not going to approach you with an agenda. Well, this is something that you wrote about in 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 your book as well. Um, how our um, human nature is to trust people because we are um, a, a, a community species or community based species, and it's not it's not in in our nature to um, doubt everybody's intentions all of the time. Yeah. Um, sometimes I'll be sitting in traffic and think to myself, like, what if I'm just driving one day and somebody just doesn't stop driving and they just drive into me? And we just kind of assume as we're in our cars driving around that everybody's being safe and sensible. But there is actually nothing to stop somebody else from just just driving into me one day. Um, so it's not in our nature to just assume the worst of everybody it's actually quite the opposite and that is another thing that makes a lot of us susceptible to uh being brought into these these uh high demand groups yeah and you know it's tricky because you don't want to walk around i mean you would be pathological if you walked around suspicious of every person you know like it's it's in your better interest and it's you know i talk about this in the book with um the book, The Confidence Game by Maria Konnikova, she talks about that. And Malcolm Gladwell's book, um, Talking to Strangers, is based all around this um, so sociological theory called uh, trust default mode. You know, we extend the benefit of the doubt because that is how our species survives. <laughs> we need to trust each other. However, there are predatory people out there who will take advantage of that, you know? So how do you strike a balance? It's very tricky. It is, and this is something else that, that is so important with what you've written that I, that I really have written notes here to go into in, in okay. a lot more detail, but the amount of sources that you reference in your work shows that your your research into this area of, of study in understanding your experience but also how it happens across all of these groups universally is so incredible it it's you can't deny you can't deny the the methodologies that are used across all of these groups after yeah. reading your book it's like it's it's like all of that it all of the information in one place and I I think I've said this to Jeffrey Wallace about his work as well but you could read through that book and pull out all of the sources and go and then just read all of, it's like a reading list but in a memoir so you could just be like oh, I'm gonna yep yeah, oh, oh cults in our cults in our midst oh yeah I'll, I'll read that one and there's so many different books and and sources that you reference that you could literally just make a a reading list out out of the the things that you've written about and that's another thing that's so important about the work that you've written it talks about how your experience is applicable to experiences in all other cult-like groups and I yeah. actually made a note at the top of my notes here that you said in your in your memoir you you said that this book is a template for others to customize in their own ways for their yeah. own healing journeys and I was like wow that's incredible because you really could just take everything that 
you speak about in your book and apply it to other experiences, but tailor it for the individual, which of course you couldn't do <laughs> during your time in school. Mm -mm. And you know, it's, it's, the book is really meant to be this three part. I mean, the format's a little, uh, I'll say unique because it's memoir, it's research and it's recovery or I like to think of it as empowerment, you know? So um, it's got like these three missions, you know, here's an example. <laughs> here's my crazy example of, you know, getting duped into, you know, um, exploitative group. Um, here is, here are the results of my obsessive research after I left and said, oh my God, what the, the fuck have I been doing for the last five years? <laughs> And here are the things that helped me to recover that I want to offer to you as just a platform, you know, take it and make it yours. I, I imagine that you have been approached and you, you are in communication with other X-Men. And we know that from, well, I know that from reading your 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 book and, uh, and others as they get the chance to read it will also learn that you have been and are in, in contact with other uh, ex-members of this particular group um but I wonder how many will go on to read it and be able to apply your experiences or even remember the key moments in the book that you explore but something you said then about meeting with Lisa she was kind of odd but she didn't really talk much about herself do yeah. you think that she would have had anything specific to actually draw on or talk about at that point because she must have been quite deep in the group to be asked to recruit other members Probably not. I mean, you know, I will tell you a little story, which I don't think I included in the book. I might have. I can't remember now because it's like you, you just can't remember what you write. But um, at least I can't. <laughs> like, it's, I write it down, then I forget. But um, there was a very specific kind of coffee date where I told her, you, I, I was like, you, like, you're the only person in my life I blab about myself this much with. You know, I was like, it's weird. It's a little uncomfortable for me. It's nice, you know, but I was like, how about you? Tell me how you met your husband. And she um, got really uncomfortable. <laughs> um, she said, we met in an acting class. And then she said, it's hard to explain. And then I thought. That well, is in the book. And then she moves straight on to, yeah. to something else. And, and, and the conversation goes back to you again. Yeah, because she can't talk about it because they were set up, they were arranged married married in the group, you know, um, they, <laughs> yeah, she can't tell me that, like my cult leader told me to marry Josh. <laughs> I mean, you know, maybe it was a little more nuanced than that, maybe they were, they were, there's a, there was an acting class, you know, maybe they were in the acting class together and they, they started to Sparks like sparks and chemistry. Yes, perhaps. Yes, yeah. But she couldn't say like, I was in an acting class, my cult acting class. And so was he, you know, it's just um, strange to think that that individualism is stripped away so much in this group over time that I wonder if at this point, Lisa had any thoughts or feelings that were her own and even if she did if she would have felt comfortable enough to express them to anybody especially really in the space of recruiting somebody where she is using a script and a process that has been handed to her and taught to her by yeah. people in the group you know we're told not to talk about ourselves too much this isn't about you you know <laughs> I mean she was just following protocol that's so strange because when you first join, it is all about you and how you can make a difference and how you can empower yourself and, and from empowering yourself can go on to empower others. And I may, maybe we're being a bit culty in this episode because I've spoken to Spencer and I've read your book. So I know enough about the subject to talk about it with like inside information. But anybody that's listening to this episode that has absolutely no idea what we're talking about, um, but, you know, I think other cult, this is exactly the same as in other cults. I think if you've had a culty experience, you're going to be like, yep, it was exactly the same. And it's hard with this group, though, because it doesn't have an actual name. Like, we can't just say, um, like, we, we, we can't just say um, 
the solar temple or the order of the solar temple or the Sullivanians or the Manson yeah. family or the no. fundamentalist Latter-day Saints. It's, so it's hard because there's no name to apply to it. Um, but we have talked that it, uh, about it being a, a secret group, uh, the, the, the history of when the group was set up. We've mm. got to the point now uh, where you have had enough meetings with Lisa to be honoured with an introduction to Robert, yeah. whose profound opening line to you <laughs> is something about the rain being tears of angels. angels tears. <laughs> yes. Uh. It's it's strange though because when I read that part in your book, I didn't read it sarcastically, and now I'm thinking that maybe I should have. <laughs> well, you know what? There's no should here. <laughs> um, I can tell you that when I told my friend Phyllis, you know, because after I left, the, one of the first things I did after I left was tell everyone in my uh, you know immediate circle like uh, I've been in this weird group for the last five years, and when I told her about the angels' tear, she was like Esther. You have no idea how fast I would have been running out the door. <laughs> yeah, that is, yeah, that is, um, I don't know. It's like a really bad pickup line that somebody <laughs> might say at like three o'clock in the morning in a bar when everybody's emptied out and people are like, hey, good looking. Why are you crying? Don't cry at three in the morning. Oh, things look like the tears of an angel. <laughs> so, yeah. Very funny. So you meet Robert. He comes out with a number of profound things. Yeah, so Robert went right into the whole origin story that school was using at the time and probably still is using about how we are, we really don't belong here. And um, I think actually this is an important thing, Casey, because... Um, um, and I think I do say this in the book. I didn't, you know, I was totally being set up. I mean, I told Lisa that I didn't feel like I belonged on the planet, you know? And so when, when the very first, you know, piece of profundity, well, first these are the angels that are crying, but then the second one is we don't really belong here. Humans are really essence, energy from the starry world, we come to earth to learn something. We come to earth to uh, resolve a, um, I can't remember what the phrase was, you know, like a, an essence flaw, some kind of an essential flaw. Um, you know, it was one of the, you know, the first things he starts talking about after the angels. And if I was savvy, I would have been thinking, why is this guy bringing this up? But I wasn't. I was like, these guys, these people get me. I I really don't belong here. That's why I feel like I don't belong here. Because I don't belong here. They're telling me that this is true, you know? And I so badly at that time to feel like I wasn't crazy. You know, that, that somebody else felt the same way. And so... You know, as I told you before, Lisa was taking notes on our conversations. He knew exactly which, you know, piece of wisdom to bring to that coffee shop. And that's the difficulty in reading these parts of people's stories, because we I know that you join this group and that you stay with the group for a number of years. But there's that moment in these interactions where you think, what? would have happened if she just thought those things to herself right. in that moment and yeah. as as a reader it's unfair for me to have those thoughts because how many times have you said that to yourself when you've punished yourself for making these decisions think of it like a play or something the the audience would be going no right no don't do it and, and, and me as a character would be like that sounds awesome I'm in, which is what happened, you know? Um, that is absolutely what what, what happens yeah. as a reader, reading the book as well, when you think, don't, don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> but you do, you do decide to, to, to go along um, to your yeah. first group Yeah, so session. the opportunity, you know what, I should, I should 
also say that then, you know, we have this conversation and um, he he says, how would you like to try this free five week experiment called school? Um, and, you know, we have this back and forth where I'm like, well, does it cost anything? And he's like, well, there's a tuition, but we, you know, um, we've never said no to anyone because of finances, which is complete bullshit. I find out later, but, um, um, you know, I, I think, um, and then I said to him and myself, it can't hurt if I don't like it, I'll leave. You know, I have free choice here. And the thing is, the thing to keep in mind there is, I think, you know, if I had sat down with Robert by myself, I don't think I would have said yes. But I was extending the benefit of the doubt to him through Lisa. Lisa was my friend. I trusted Lisa. She drove me home you know, from the museum when I was coughing. She would not set me up. She wouldn't be introducing me to, you know, a guy who was trying to scam me. <laughs> so by proxy, he earns my trust. Even though, you know, he said a lot of batshit things to me over the last, like, let's say hour and 15 minutes, you know. <laughs> and there are instincts that you have. Mm hmm that kick in from the moment that you meet Lisa in Whole Foods and yeah. they do stick with you and they do continue with you yeah. throughout your entire, as you say, misadventure. I love that you call it your misadventure because it's like, <laughs> you're not, a, you're not calling it a, 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 a mistake or a prison sentence or so many other phrases that you could apply to the experience. You're calling it a misadventure, which is, a, yeah. um, it's allowing you that space to know that, something bad happened but you're not blaming yourself you know because when you call it a mistake it's it's like you're labeling that as something that you've done wrong I made a mistake but you're not you're it's a, a five-year misadventure yeah and um, because it wasn't your fault and you're not to blame and it's not a mistake that you made no. and I really liked that I, and I don't know if that's why you chose that wording. I'm just kind of yes. like doing that thing you do in English lessons where they say what why did Romeo wear a blue shirt um <laughs> but, but you were you are correct that is why I'm using that word and know? I feel like that's so it, it's giving back some power to to other readers that that may have experienced things in their life that that weren't their fault but they may label it as a mistake or something that that they that they um caused or put on themselves which might not be the case uh so nice. yes five-year misadventure yeah, I mean, it was an intentional deception. <laughs> oh, that's another one. Intentional deception and fabricated friendship. Yeah. We, you know, it was very these, calculated uh, and intentional. All under the guise of offering me tools, you know, that were going to um, help me remember myself. I don't know if, if, <laughs> if Spencer used the phrase, remember yourself. That was the big, you know... That was the big, uh, I guess, um, thing that we were striving for. Nobody knew what the fuck it meant, right? But we were going to remember ourselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He Well, Spencer kind of just said, oh, well, you'll have to read my book because, because Spencer has a, 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 a memoir that yeah. depicts his personal experiences in the Manhattan branch of, of this group yeah. um, or corporate headquarters, as you call called it. <laughs> um, but he said... Well, it's kind of like a strange set of beliefs. You'll have to read my book to understand it more. But what it basically was, was X, Y, Z. Um, and that's really all I can tell you. Um, and I kind of got it because I was thinking it is very convoluted to try and explain to people in a in a in a very quick summarized way. Yeah. Um, and obviously the writing that you and Spencer have done it will allow the reader to understand that in a in a, in a in a deep dive um explained way that yeah. you can't get across in a 2 hour interview um yeah. <laughs> so i did i did really appreciate spencer kind of being like well here's kind of the basics of it but that's not really what it is but it is what it is um and to learn more you'll have to read my book um <laughs> I have to be honest, I kind of love that because it's 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 just as murky as he presented it. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. And I, I have a quote here actually 
Um, I don't know if Spencer will listen to this episode. I'm, I'm sure that he will. Um, oh, I'll be um, nudging him to listen, by the way. So. <laughs> I, do, I do get the, uh, the honour of receiving um, weekly or so emails from Spencer, which always make my day when I read them. But he, today he, he said something that was particularly interesting ahead of, of our chat. He said, uh, we had similar experiences, many but like all cult or crime victims, our reactions had some differences. Like if a bomb went off in a crowd, folks would have different injuries depending upon many factors. Also, victims have different ways of describing the abuse. Esther's voice is distinctly erudite and compassionate. You'll have a great talk with her. Oh my God. Isn't that wonderful? Thank you, Sir Spence. I'm just going to say this right now. That is so sweet. I think that's great. That's so great. And I then went on to tell him that I was stealing his metaphor of, uh, of uh, how people will suffer different injuries from the same yeah. assault. So um, thank you for that one. Again, Spencer, if you are listening, yeah. uh, we're both very, very fond of you. And thank you for your, yeah. your work and your voice and uh, everything that you have done in also highlighting this particular group. What Casey said. <laughs> and so these instincts that you have from the moment you meet Lisa and Whole Foods, they stay with you throughout your entire time with school. And, and those instincts are incredibly important to you later on in terms yeah. of having your snapping moment or your waking up moment. Um, and it, it, we always like to highlight when we get the chance in these episodes that those doubts and those those feelings of um, discomfort or those instincts that you have that might be niggling in, in the very back of your mind that the you know all the cognitive dissonance that you said you were experiencing from from that very first moment mm -hmm. um, it's okay to explore those things um, even if you feel like you don't have the time, even if you feel like you don't have the headspace, um, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be an immediate thing. If you have a thought or feeling or doubt that you feel like you need to explore, you can you can put it to the wayside for a little while, but don't dismiss it completely. Just let it kind of sit there. Um, and then hopefully it will fester just as much as everything else gets to fester and, uh, <laughs> and something more will come of it. But these yes. instincts are definitely something we'll talk about later. And you have these instincts when you meet Robert and he has all of these things to yeah. say. And he says, come and join. There's a, a free, in air quotes, because again, that's appealing. There's a yeah. free five week course that you can come and take part of. And if you enjoy it, then, then, there's a, then there's a tuition that you need to pay. But it's OK, because we don't worry. It's not about the money. Um, right. just just come and experience these five weeks and you think yeah what have I got to lose I'm I'm in a really difficult time in my life um there's 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 loads of changes happening I've not been very happy I trust Lisa and her family and her eight-year-old child so I in turn I trust you Robert um so you've invited me and if I don't like it I just won't go back which yeah. is exactly what Spencer said yeah yeah exactly you know same process really you know, slightly different details. Absolutely. Same. So do you remember what day of the week it was? Whereabouts your first session was? What it looked like? How many people were there? Um, in this in this secret, oh, you mustn't tell anybody society that you're finally getting to go in and, and access. Well, again, I can't remember if I talk about this in the book, but I, I probably do. Um, so I, and I have the meeting with Robert. I can't tell you how much time went by between that and I get, get a phone call from Lisa that's, you know, like, you know, I probably met with him in late June or July. In August, I get a phone call from Lisa. There's a class starting, you know. She's like, meet me at this Whole Foods in Cambridge, which is another verb. Cambridge, you know, home of Harvard University. That's, you know, planet academia, basically. Um, and, um meet me at this Whole Foods, and um, I did, and then I followed her car to the Belmont Lions Club, again, another suburb of Boston, a uh, very affluent suburb. It was maybe a mile from the Whole Foods, and um, I was thinking, why didn't she just give me an address, <laughs> right? Like what, like, what is all the cloak and dagger stuff, 
You know, like, why am I following her car to the Lions Club? <laughs> and um, so what did she say to you? She's like, I need you to meet me here so that you can follow me to the destination. She didn't even say that. She said, just meet me at the Whole Foods, you know. And, you know, well, I guess I assumed that she was going to take me to the class or tell me how to get there or something. But she could have just right left a message saying it's going to start. Here's the address. It's so strange, isn't it? In the way that the approach is so casual, but the actual execution of the process is so regimented and so very calculated, calculated that it's yeah. the opposite of casual. So even in 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 that is is not the cognitive dissonance, but almost the juxtaposition of two things happening at once. There's a casual. Oh, just meet me, meet me at this address, and then you get there. She's like, oh, just follow my car now. I'm going to take you to where the class is. Right. And you're thinking like, why didn't she just tell me the address? <laughs> but at the same time, you're like, okay, I'll just follow your car. So it's even even in in that there is stuff to 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 unpack and and to think about. Yeah, I mean, and and there was something also very intriguing about it, right? Absolutely, like... yeah, definitely. <laughs> and and uh, they, they, there's probably a number of reasons it's done that way, isn't there? Just so that you can say, well, we don't want people to find out about us, so it needs to be done in this way. That's why you need to pay for right. your own voicemail service because it's not safe for you to have your your phone number out there, um, yeah. you know, in the public space. Um, and and it's also safer for you to follow me in my car because it's 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 not uh it's not public information where these classes are being held right yeah yeah and you know again somebody who was a little more savvy might have been asking more questions than I was um like or or voicing I had questions I just didn't voice them right that's something to think about I didn't want her to be uncomfortable so I didn't say like Lisa why didn't you just give me the address this is weird you know (laughs) And so many times in your book, there are moments where where there is there are thoughts and feelings that you have, but there's no opportunity for you to put them out into yeah. the open. Um, and I've made a note to talk about an um, an interaction between Sharon and a member of the group where that specific thing happens, where there's the where there is the thoughts and feelings in your mind and the inability to voice them out loud, um, which has a certain effect and and impact on, on, on you further down the line. Um, But what, what happens when you, do you, you pull up to the venue and she's like, we're here or. She kind of walks me in and (laughs) I walk into this room. It's kind of a, a big, open space and there were these uh, what I remember is like kind of benches and chairs around the periphery um and a few people kind of sitting and reading or meditating everyone was very quiet and then there were these a couple of women were setting up you know a little snack table and I was kind of yammering at her I think I was probably very anxious and I didn't even know You know, I'm like, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I have no idea what I was saying to her. (laughs) Um, But, um, um, and she seemed a little nervous and probably because I was yammering at her and she probably didn't know how to say to me, you know, you can't talk right now because I was so new because there was this 10 minutes of silence that we were supposed to observe before class. All right. So there there's people sitting around reading you know the bible or um i don't know um walden pond you know or whatever and um and some people were just meditating and then there were a couple people who were setting up this table and she introduced me to this man i remember her saying like Oh, Matt, this is Esther. She's going to join us. And he looked super nervous. And I think later I realized he was nervous because we weren't supposed to be talking. <laughs> so he's kind of like, what, how do I react here? Just like, yeah, nod yeah. at her, make a, make a gesture. Is that <laughs> communication? Is that loud? Right, um, like, I don't know what to do in this situation. 
Right, exactly. And then, you know, people started f coming in, t you know, filing in to through the front door, and I was no taking note that no one was talking. You know, they'd kind of smile and nod at each other, and then they'd sit. And Do so you feel like the conformity kind of washed over you pretty quickly at that point and you were like oh okay it's quiet time I don't I think maybe not of my very first day there like I was I was too anxious to care <laughs> about the conformity right but certainly it was, didn't take very long for that to seep, seep in um and so then you know I I'm gonna guess again I'm I am not good with uh, with numbers like you I struggle with math um so like let's say 30 40 50 people show up um and suddenly um one of the teachers announces <laughs> this just makes me laugh because it's so cinematic like he just said it's time for tai chi <laughs> so everyone lined up to do tai chi and this teacher whose name is michael started gathering up me and there were like maybe five new people and he gathered us all together and explained that we we start our class with tai chi and i'll show you the first couple of moves and i had been taking tai chi for a long time I, I, really wonderful teacher and he asked us you know have any of you done it before and i i told him yeah i've you know studied at the tree of life with peter wayne and he's he he kind of smirked like oh i know that guy <laughs> So then we learned some Tai Chi and I, I, I have to tell you, I was like, this is not as impressive as what I've learned, <laughs> you know, um, you know, and then, um, you know, we, I think that was like 30 minutes of Tai Chi and the, the other class, you know, the, the people that the longer term students were just doing the form on their own, you know, so they all kind of lined up and started doing the form. Michael showed the newbies the first few moves, and then the younger class, as we were known, it's there's an older class and a younger class. The younger class, like five or six new people, get ushered into a separate room. Yes, the division, so much of it. Yes, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, I, I'm pretty sure, yeah, our first class was definitely with Robert, and I I, I did write about that in, in there, yeah. Robert, you know, so we... Michael is teaching the young the young ones. Yes. And Robert is teaching the old ones. Um oh sorry that was confusing. With the Tai Chi, Michael is teaching the young ones, right? Right. But as soon as the classes are separated, Robert comes into the younger class. Okay. To, to teach us. So he's he's with this younger group, you know, um in the in the early days. Okay, um, so that's not particularly um, unique or bizarre in the way that a group might get together and have 10 minutes of act, some type of activity. Um, even when I, uh, in my previous job, worked for a children's charity and uh, on the weekday nights we would have two hour sessions uh, for the, the children. They were, they were all young carers. So they all looked after somebody else in the home that had a, a, a phys physical cognitive uh, disability. And so the children would be there for two hours of respite to just join in activities and have fun. But a lot of the time I would have 10 minutes of just trying to blow off steam because these yeah. were all children that had so much energy yeah. And uh, and I could never have a conversation with all of them at once with with their attention as soon as we got there. So I would have some kind of like, let's play tag or something wild for 10 minutes and then we're going to sit down yeah. and everybody can. So I don't know if that in itself is particularly bizarre. 10 minutes of Tai Chi at the start of a session or, or, or X amount of, of, of minutes of activity before you go into the main Mm -hmm. part of the session but certainly getting there and nobody talks to each other in a communal setting with friends getting together again in air quotes friends right. getting together to discuss existential thoughts and feelings but then actually nobody's allowed to speak um so that's kind of strange and then when you go into the room with Robert and start to do more of his work, 
um again I guess that's where things might get a little bit stranger yeah well in in there, there it's a very um intentional separation between older student and younger students right so smaller class newer people we had more free flowing conversation you know what's your name what brought you here what do you do for work you know um and then robert shows up and he starts introducing um the work which is really based off of something called the fourth way um i don't know if well yeah actually i talk about it in the book and spencer probably mentioned it you know fourth way grief you know um they never mention the fourth way. They never mention Gurdjieff. Okay. He just starts introducing these ideas. Um, but in the smaller class, um, it was, it was a conversation that went back and forth. What is strange is that the work is plagiarized by a, an extremely well-known philosopher who was never named or credited in any of the work that you do. So Never. school claims to have these enlightened and incredibly profound teachings that have come from a, a higher place when actually it's just, is it Gurdjieff? I can't pronounce his yeah, name. Yeah, Gurdjieff, Gurdjieff, I think. Or, um, Gurdjieff. Uh, I've heard it pronounced both ways, Gurdjieff or Gurdjieff. Um, yeah, George Gurdjieff's like a uh, German, Swedish philosopher. I think um, he is Russian Armenian. That yeah, a Russian uh, probably makes more sense, and listeners yeah. are going to be like, "Kosu, do your research." Um, <laughs> but but yeah, Gurdjieff is is a is a uh, Russian philosopher. Um, he's not Swedish um, or German. He's Russian, um, and his work is the work that is used in school teachings. But yeah. he's never named, never mentioned. So you no never one. have any inkling that that this work is completely plagiarized from a very not, well-known philosopher. Not not a drop. You know, and, it was secret esoteric knowledge passed down from mystery schools through the ages. That's what it was presented to us as. And was it in, in your writing or Spencer's where you talk about the name of the philosopher it's ever mentioned? It's black, it's blacked out. And oh, just... that was me. So I don't know if they did this in New York. In in uh, Boston, um, so Gurdjieff had a student named Ospensky. Um, Ospensky wrote a book called In Search of the Miraculous. The book was published. Um, but in Boston, where they never mention Gurdjieff or Ospensky, and they say this is primarily an oral teaching, um, you know, in fact, there was some kind of a little, little bit of poo-pooing about writing things down initially. One day they, um, a teacher came in with a bunch of what they called the black books where, you know, uh, they said that this is a series of lectures transcribed, you know, transcribed by a great teacher. You know, one teacher did the lectures, the other teacher transcribed. So that was my understanding. Um, and the names were redacted, certain dates were redacted. I mean, <laughs> Casey, someone, um, spent time Xeroxing an entire published book because it was yep. in search of the miraculous. And that's, that's, was going to be my next point. Uh, did, no, well, I suppose that, that, that why would there be any reason for you to say, where you know where did this come from I'm not I'm not sure I trust your sources um or I'm not sure I trust where you got this from well, even no, if you redacted segments within the writing yeah and, and no no you know I think nobody either had the the kahunas for lack of better language to be that confrontational you know um again a red flag <laughs> yes <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> so Uspensky is um, a, a, a very well-known esotericist. Is that the right word? Eso is that esotericist? I believe so. We, we might have to look that up. But <laughs> So even, even though he is a former student of Gurdjieff, he is somebody who 
was known for yeah secret like, secret societies um and and hidden hidden groups um and keeping um um and keeping important or sacred information um within a certain a group so it's almost like school is based off of the the well it school was using the work of Uspensky but even it it's it's almost like school adopted the things that Uspensky stood for as a as an individual and created school from his belief system but then didn't credit him for his work or his um contribution to esoteric societies and did very well in keeping certain information uh, uh, and 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 group work and meetings a secret uh-huh. but al- almost took it too far in how much they kept a secret again yeah. I'm struggling to formulate what I'm trying to say um they based their their workings off of Uspensky and his life's work but then didn't credit him for actually not just using what he did in his career but actually using his writing and the claiming that it was their own written published work you know that's that it yeah they, they I mean basically hijacked it right Pl- plagiarized it and um, what did Uspensky teach in in his in his writing that that was or or how was it uh taught to you in in school when you were doing your work I have to tell you Casey I remember reading it and discussing it and there are certain um ideas that he talks about um the law of three um the octave the law of the octave um you know um Oh, being awake versus in, versus being asleep and the different levels of of being um asleep um um even the idea of awakening to oneself you know um remembering oneself that those things were all discussed in this book and i i mean beyond that it's all a big blur to me <laughs> you know i remember like the the buzz phrases um that's that that that's quite similar to a lot of people I speak to that have religious trauma though that say I can reel off passages from the bible you know off the of like they're written on the back of my hand but I could not tell you what the interpretations were supposed to be what they were really supposed to mean Right. Um, they were used to justify certain actions by leadership, but I couldn't tell you what those passages were actually trying to teach us. Yeah. Um, so that's quite interesting in the way that you can kind of reel off some of the ideas and passages that Uspensky wrote about, mm-hmm. but you couldn't really tell me what they were supposed to mean or how you apply them to your everyday life to yeah. make the changes that school promised you you could make. Right. I mean, the, I think the one idea that stayed with me, um, was the idea of identification, which was, if I can try to explain this to you, just the idea of how we over identify with a particular thing. Like for example, you know, um, if you, if your career is a journalist, that becomes your identity. Um, And, you know, the idea is like, oh, you identify too much with that. That's not your identity. That's something that you do, you know? Um, Okay. Well, it kind of made sense in your book when you talked to me about how your personality is not your identity and how they are two different things, which which kind of resonated. And I talk a lot on the show about how somebody's cult experience is not their entire identity. It's definitely a part of who they are um and and will will make up parts of their personality because of the experiences that they've had much in the way that somebody that has a, a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis or cancer might decide not to be defined by that diagnosis yeah. but understand that it is a part of who they are and of their identity but not that that is all that they are right yeah yeah that's kind of the idea you know um um, you know, it's kind of funny, maybe because we're 
we're so specifically trying to parse this out, you know, for an audience, I'm having a little trouble articulating it, but you know, when, when school, when someone, a teacher would say, you know, you're becoming identified with something, it was kind of like, um, you're, um, it, it wasn't good. <laughs> You know, you're you're becoming identified with that particular situation. To... Oh my goodness, I read something about this recently and it I wish I could remember what it was because I read it and I thought that is so accurate. And it was some I've just I've just done it there, which is a perfect example. It was something about um people that relates everything back to themselves are accused of hijacking or being narcissistic when actually it's a basic human tool of communication to yeah. enable you to make friendships and relationships and to have common ground with people to mm -hmm. make you relatable and to make you um to 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 get your empathy and your sympathy across um, and so much in the way that I speak to people on this show about their spiritual experiences, where I grew up atheist, um, and, and a lot of the time, if people leave negative ratings on the show, it will often say this person has no experience of cults personally, or this person has no experience of religion personally. So how can they possibly speak to the experiences of others? It comes back to that, um, what I just said there. It's yeah. not necessarily that somebody is narcissistic or trying to hijack the conversation every time. There are certainly people that do that. And I have had experience and conversations with people that do do that. And perhaps there are times on this show where people will be thinking right now, Casey, that's what you always do. Then again, that might just be my inner critic talking. I don't know. I think but so. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's that sort of um, the, the, the thing I read said, stop trying to make people feel like they are doing something wrong when they are simply saying, do you know what? I'm really sorry that happened to you. There was a time where I felt that that same way. And if yeah. you want to speak to somebody about it, I remember when my someone passed away and this is how I felt or I remember when I was in a job that I hated and 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 the the work environment was toxic and this is how I felt and that doesn't mean that you're trying to take the attention away from the individual who's expressing their pain or discomfort or grief it yeah. just means that you are allowing that person to understand that you have experienced that too or maybe you also got an A on your English exam and you want to tell the person who got an A in the English exam that you too are an A grade student. It doesn't always have to be negative situations that you say to somebody, I felt that too. It can also be things that people want to brag about and rejoice about and, and, and associate positively with. That might be... It, it, validating that person by saying to them you're not alone in this experience yeah. because I myself have experienced it so I know that you're not on your own yeah 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 I mean it, it gets it gets murky but yeah you know um so when school is saying to you you're identifying with that too much it's like they're stopping you from allowing that experience to happen they're stopping you from allowing that oh my goodness, I've had that experience or I feel the same way about that thing or I feel connected to that place or that person or that subject in the way that you're telling me you feel connected to that person or that subject. They're stopping that yeah. into and changing. A, and there's another kind of level of it where like if you're identifying with something, you don't have enough objectivity. You're not separated enough from it. You're merging with it, you know? And I mean, it's, it's a little tricky because, um, you know, perspective is important in life. Right. Um, but it's probably if somebody's telling you, um, in a very punitive way that you're identifying with that and you don't have enough perspective and objectivity that, it, you know, that's not helpful. <laughs> it's kind of this emotional, you know, taking an emotional ram, like a battering ram, you know, um, Which 
is a, a kind of familiar and uh, um, relates back to what we were saying before about, you know, just kind of slapping a band aid on it and saying um, this yeah. token response is how you should deal with that problem. When, yeah. of course, individually, that's not ever going to be helpful um, from person to person. So this work around Uspensky that is not actually ever uh, revealed to be uh, Uspensky. When did you find out that it was his writing? After I left. How did you feel when you realised that it was like a, a well, pub- published I a was philosopher's sure. work? I was, I was livid. Who, who were you taught to believe had penned all of these? Well, it was, you know, it was part of the mystery. We didn't have to know. <laughs> they would say, <laughs> Casey, I mean, really, I have to laugh about this. A great teacher of the work once transcribed these lectures. <laughs> Just think about what a remarkable memory this person must have had. <laughs> to write them verbatim from... from... Yes, right, right. And then, you know, someone else conveniently went in there with a whiteout and... <laughs> <laughs> redacted names and dates and yeah what, how did they how did they explain away all of the redactions well you know I don't think I don't remember anyone explaining that and there was so much that we accepted because everything was secret everything was esoteric you know and and that um secretiveness um which they called private by the way I, you know like they kind of hijacked the word private i'm like you're not talking about private you're talking about secret that's different you know yes which you do explain again perfectly in your work as well you do talk about how private is something that is um individual um so if i say you can't read my journals they're private that's because they belong to me um, and they are my property and they are my thoughts and my feelings and my identity and my individualism and everything that goes into the word private. You know, my life with my partner in the bedroom is private. Um, it's not secret because if it's secret, that means that it, it then allows other people to become involved in that. Um, um, and unless there's a lengthy discussion between me and my partner on when it ch- things change from private to secret, then uh, then it's remaining private. Right, yeah. I mean, there was just so much that we, I think, you know, with the frog in the pot analogy, right? Boiling a frog, right? That we just started to accept. And after a while, you stop asking questions, you know? Um, well, you've already said that there wasn't a an accepting environment for things like asking questions um or or speaking um right or speaking out yeah i mean so then when you think about like steve hassan's um bite model the information control that communication was so highly highly controlled you know when you get to class you observe 10 minutes of silence then we do tai chi then we sit down and we have a discussion, which, by the way, we didn't get to this yet. But once you move from the youngest class into the older class, it's no longer a free flowing conversation. You stand up and wait to be called on like in grade school. So the teachers are orchestrating their puppet masters. That is so strange, isn't it? But mm-hmm. it's again, it's it's a it's a definite um, decision that's been made for the groups to work that way. Because if you were to go into the older class from the start, you would think, well, this isn't an environment that I'm comfortable with. But you've had the opportunity in the younger class to bond with people, to have real conversations, to get invested in that work. So five after your five weeks, you move up and you're suddenly in this strange new situation where everything has changed. But you're already invested in that group you've already yes. made those friendships and bonds and and it's already become a, a, a staple part of your routine yes you have won the big prize of understanding how intentional this um manipulation this indoctrination is that is so it that's so hideous isn't it it's hideous <laughs> You know, and then you get into the older class and you've gotten used to certain level of rules and you 
you just roll into the next level of rules. Okay. Oh, but and then, you know, your essence friends, you don't have, you don't gossip with your essence friends, you know, in, in school language, that means you don't share normal things with them. They don't know where you work. They don't know about your kid. They don't know about your dog. You know, we talk about, <laughs> we talk about ideas. <laughs> so, and then at the end of class, um, Casey, you honor an, uh, an hour of silence in between class and whatever you're going to, probably home, because, you know, it got later and later, right? <laughs> um, and um, and you're, you do this to seal off the work. So you don't really have a chance ever to have a normal conversation with your essence friends. And when you see them in the world, you you pretend like you don't know each other. There's so many things in your last kind of four sentences that are so intrinsic to this undue influence and coercion. Mm -hmm. Not only are you moving up into a group where things change, but you're already invested by this point. So you think, oh, okay, well, I'll just see how this goes. Yeah. Oh my goodness, hang on. Let me just... <laughs> work okay. through this so you're you move up and you're you're that so now you're expected to pay 350 dollars a month in tuition when you move yeah. when you move up yeah you're yeah. no longer allowed to have open friendly discussions about things like individualism that include the name of your dog and where you take him for walks and the name of your children and how old they are and where they go to school yeah um you talk about ideas. So I'm guessing ideas around Uspensky's work and the, 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 the reading that you're doing. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, so there's that, but then there's also, you're observing this hour of silence, which means that you can't say to somebody from the group, Hey, do you want to go and get a drink after work? Or Hey, do you want to go oh. catch a movie after work or go and have <laughs> some food? Never, ever happen. But you also, if you're following school in the way that most of you were from the reading that I've done on 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 you and and, and Spencer's um, memoirs, that takes away the opportunity for you to go and tell other people outside of school where you've been, what you've been doing. Um, you know, if if the sessions are getting later and later then you're probably going home just to crash because you're getting up so early to organize parties and stuff, which we'll get onto in a little while. <laughs> there are so many things that, that, that you've just said that now we're getting into the, 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 the real crux of how a person is completely stripped of everything and, and rebuilt in the way that leadership wants them to be rebuilt and if there is any pushback or any difficulty life gets extremely uncomfortable for the individual who is no longer allowed to exist as an individual which you depict in your work so beautifully um it's it's really something so the, the the title of of the memoir which we haven't even said yet is is the gentle souls revolution a secret cult an open rebellion and life lessons about protecting and honoring your gentle soul and what you do in your work is you don't you don't do what what I try and do in these interviews which is chronologically go through somebody's experiences and say okay so this happened in a b c d e f g in your work, you say, this is what happened. This is how it felt. And then, and then this is what happened. And this is how it felt. But it felt like this because of this. And then it felt like this because of this. But let's go back to this because then that happened. And it's not confusing in the way like the film Memento, if you've ever watched that, Christopher Nolan's Memento is like the most bizarre, fragmented, <laughs> strange storyline. It's not like that. It, 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 what it does is it allows you to explore how that relates to other groups and cults and cult-like methods and to apply actual other lived experiences of people that you've spoken to and interviewed for your writing to say, this is why leadership did this. And this is the effect that it had on me. 
And this is the effect that it had on other people from this organization and this group and this movement. And this is what they did. And this is what I did. And then what happened from that is this and this and this. And that is what is so important about your work. Even though it's not chronological in the way I try and formulate these interviews in some roundabout way, it, it, it gives us your entire journey almost from like an aerial perspective Hmm. which allows us to bring in and understand other people's experiences and you have this way in your writing of giving other people other survivors a voice almost like they have their own passages in your book which I thought was really moving and really empowering and I imagine that anybody that you've sat down and spoken with and referenced in your book uh, will feel the same way I feel like they will feel seen and listened to um, and that their uh, and that their experiences um, and and the effects that that stay with them every day are validated in in your writing which is so amazing but what I'm trying to say but by kind of talking about all of this is that your your book is kind of like this is how I got pulled into a cult and this is how I rebelled (laughs) but your rebellion doesn't come for a very long time um it kind of it's internal internally it's always there but outwardly it, it doesn't it doesn't come into the forefront um, until you have a, a few close allies push you into um, un, uh, understanding and feeling confident enough to uh, take up your your rebellion. Um, yeah. But you've 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 met Lisa. She's kind of reeled you in systematically through a process that has been taught to her uh, mm-hmm. step by step. You mm-hmm. meet Robert. He has some profound ideas and and you feel seen and listened to and understood. You say, yes, I'll try this five week course. You go to the five week course. You're separated from from the the older group. You make friends, maybe, or you make people that you meet people that have similar interests. You sit down with them. You have conversations. You have something to look forward to each week. Um, I take my kids to play group uh, one day a week. And I know that the other mums that understand what I am going through during these COVID pandemic days, which is kind of unique to what other parents in other generations have been through. So when my mum says, I just used to do this, completely doesn't apply to my situation. You know, I know that that on those days, I have those mums to sit down with and say, let me tell you everything that's happened. And let me listen to everything that you've been through and let's support each other. So you have this thing to look forward to each week. It soon becomes your routine. Then you move up to the older group, Uh which is like, if there are tears in something, isn't it human nature to be competitive and think, I want to be in in those higher ranks. I want to know what goes on in the older groups. There's that secrecy element again and that allure that's like, let me in, let me in. And then you go to the older group and things are very different. But yeah. then you think to yourself, I'll I'll give it a go. I'll stay. Yeah. Well, you know, um, like every other cult on the planet there, you know, the first uh, the first bit is very love bomby. Right. Um, and with school, it was a very slow process. Um, and you know, up to that point, like, I'm like, okay, I'm single. I'm broke. I have all these artistic aspirations. I'm not manifesting any of them. And oddly, within, I don't know, two, three, four months of being in school, I start seeing someone who is the person I'm now married to, by the way, not in the group, whole other story. (laughs) Um, Find a permanent job that, did I love it? No, but it was a job. And I kind of convinced myself that I really like this job. It turned out to be a fiasco, but that's a whole other, (laughs) um, a whole other, you know, chapter of, of this story. 
Um, and um, I'm learning these new ideas and I have this new community of people and these people really get me and we're all working together to remember ourselves and we we're doing these things that we call five week aims you know and five week aims are essentially goals you know but they were they were constructed in a very specific way and we had to measure them and we had to report on our progress and it was exciting you know it was like oh my god i'm actually making some progress in life for once <laughs> right um, I feel like anybody that makes to-do lists and actually ever manages to cross anything off of one of those lists is like, we'll know exactly what you're, what you're saying now. Like, yes, I just crossed some things off. But then somebody said to me one time, the thing about a to-do list is that you never get to the end because when you make a new to-do list, you add all the old things remaining from your previous to-do list to your new to-do list. And I was like, that is so upsetting. I don't want to think about never getting to the end of a to-do list. Yeah. So, you know, it felt very, um, for me, you know, I, I mean, it's interesting to think like, you know, when I think about Spencer and how we were at totally different places, like he was actually a very successful lawyer, you know, professionally, he was, he was rising through the ranks or whatever, you know, um, and um, I think he was probably pretty lonely, you know, for me, I was just flailing in every aspect of life. And suddenly I had structure, support, people, you know, accountability, and a lot of kudos and encouragement, you know, and and, you know, use these ideas, they work, you know, and like you said, at first they did work. Um, the longer you're in, the more complicated the problems get, the less the problems work, the more you feel like this used to work, what's wrong with me? I'm not trying hard enough. So when you say that they work, what are the what are the aims and promises that school gives if you work hard enough at the work that's given? Well, oh my God, that's a, that's such a good question. Um, and I can only speak to it, I think, through my experience, you know. Um, so, so for example, work and money, huge problem for me that I think, you know, comes across in the book that uh, you know, after a while, that becomes like my fatal flaw, right? You know, that I, I can't hold down a job. <laughs> um, um, but using the tools that are given to me by my sustainer and five-week aim and um, mini aims in between the five-week aim reports and accountability because I'm checking in with her and um, I mean, kind of much like Nexium, but Nixium was like cult dark. <laughs> I, I will often call school cult light just facetiously, you know. Um, it, you know, I didn't see anything as heinous as what happened Nixium, right? Um, but, you know, it's like I had this person who was keeping me on task and accountable. And, um, and then what do you know? You know, and, and, and actually, you know, my my job search became an obsession because of this, like, and, and, um, this person, this accountability person, they were called sustainers in school. Okay. Um, they were really more like minders, but they were, you know, presented as mentors and they were also supposed to be people we could talk to in confidence. And by the way, none of our conversations were confidential. They were all kind of, documented and you know reported back but we didn't know that but anyway uh, I hope I'm getting to your question so she would be feeding me school ideas like we're gonna use aim set a name for the day you know um, set a name to for the day to um, do 150 cold calls I'm making this up you know and drop your resume off at six offices and apply for this many jobs you know well I then I got a job <laughs> so the work was was specific to to you at first it wasn't like we are going to heal the world through our secret knowledge uh, one recruit not, at not a time at, yeah not not at first okay yeah. 
Yeah. Because I, I was uh, thinking about Helen Zuman's experience on Zendik Farm, about how she joined and had the community aspect, which she really enjoyed. And then there was the kind of radical take on relationships, which she then kind of um, experienced. Uh, again, not something you jumped into. And then there was the the level on top of that where the the, the matriarch would talk about how they were, well, which came from Wolf Zendik, but then translated onto to Arul after Wolf Zendik died, about how their way would change the world um and that and that their their way of living would would, would be is, yeah. well, is the correct way um yeah but, that would that would come it, later you know yeah it didn't start there so I wondered if that's kind of where your work was was going yeah yeah and I think you know again this is something you could say is true of every call right like like your work on yourself is going to elevate the radiations and refine the radiations in the world <laughs> No. So you start with yourself. Actually, um, you know, one of the ideas, and I do think this came for, from Gurdjieff, is that there were three lines of work. There was work on yourself. There was work for another, another essence friend. And then there was work for the group. Okay. So, and everything was the law of three. Everything was triangles. Um, and when um, you were doing all three, then you, your elevation, your, you know, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, so weird how the words slip away. Um, <laughs> your evolution, you know, you'll be, you'll be going up the evolutionary ladder. We're all going up the evolutionary ladder, you know, um, doing our three lines of work. Um, so when you originally join, you find yourself in a state of, of flux. You're struggling with employment. You're struggling with relationships. And mm -hmm. after being in the group for a few months, whether it was a direct, uh, whether it was a direct response to being a part of the group and uh, perhaps changing the way that you felt in your personality or the way that you presented yourself to potential employers or potential partners because you'd found something that 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 made you kind of feel uh, more comfortable or more like yourself um it's hard to say whether school was a di had a direct hand in things because we don't know what would have happened if you never found school yeah. but there's huge confirmation bias in the fact that you found a job and then you found a partner who you yeah. felt madly and deeply in love with yeah. And they had never, I mean, I never met somebody previous, you know, my, my previous relationships were not auspicious. I'll put it that way, <laughs> you know? So this is the first person I've met where I'm like, this could actually be someone I marry. And I did, you know, and we're still together. And does that feel, did, did at the time, did you, did you give credit to school or did school oh, yeah. give credit or both? It, it was, I was like, uh, I mean, it, I, again, you know, you see, this is a little, it's a little tricky because I always, always struggled with the cognitive dissonance. But in the beginning, you know, the cognitive dissonance was maybe 5% and 95% of me was going, this is fucking awesome, <laughs> right? I have new friends. I have these new ideas. Things are working. I've, you know, a, a committed, lovely new boyfriend. Um, you know, we're clearly going towards engagement. First time in my life, you know. I mean, I was in my 40s. I was like, and all I needed was this group, <laughs> right? I have never, ever gotten, gotten to a point in my life where I felt like things were working and suddenly I stumble into school and suddenly these kind of hallmarks of adulthood, right? Like work and money, relationship, having a home, suddenly they're in my life. I can achieve these things. <laughs> we've got to, we've got to Spencer's like, uh, you know people will be injured differently in the same crash we've got to that part now of this story yeah because you you mentioned before that that Spencer was a successful lawyer he had a great career he was moving up the ladder 
maybe he was a bit lonely. I know that he considers himself a, a lifelong learner, which I think we all should be or strive or, sh or should strive to be um, and, and always want to have a passion for learning in life. Uh -huh. um, and his situation on the surface was very different to yours, but you aren't going to walk away from this group now that you have this job and this and this you know this this love oh. interest that you have bonded with so strongly you can't yeah. leave what you can't leave the work behind now because who knows where it will take you in the next few years exactly. Spencer is so close to walking away at this point but then he hits a transitional period in his life where he loses his job right. and he's so low and then he makes the decision to go it on his own to go yeah. it alone to start his own company and, and they help him and yeah. they encourage him and yeah. they lift him up and they yeah. say, we support you. That's a fantastic idea. You'll be so good at this. Yeah. And so any doubt that he has about his capabilities or any inner saboteur that he has at that point is completely squashed by the overwhelming support of the group. And yeah. so he can't leave now because these are the only people in his life that have shown him that level of support, even though he didn't know them that well, because he's not allowed to know them that well. Right, um, right. And yeah. so you have both had these, like, you, you've both like joined at two different, a, a very, very, two varying parts uh, of your life and almost like swapped over uh, uh, yeah. it, 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 at some point to be clear Casey but I think I think the information control was a little different in New York um it might have been a little more squishy because I've heard them talk about you know like going out to get a beer together that is just that did not happen in Boston we didn't do that we would have gotten in big trouble <laughs> you know um but still you know he knew them in a very specific way you know and I suppose through uh, two sets of very strange circumstances, this left you both in positions that made you almost reliant on, on school and the work in mm -hmm. order to continue on the path that you're both on at this point. Right. You have um, nurtured, or if, I don't want to use the word nurtured, fostered a dependency. Okay. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Perfectly. Every cult does this, fosters dependence instead of, you know, instead of um, supporting and um, encouraging, you know, agency and independence, um, self-reliance. It's it, every, every cult will trot that out. We're going to make you a really strong person, but instead you get weaker and weaker and more and more dependent. I like to say the interest rate is high. <laughs> And you continue on this journey with your husband. Do you use his real name in the book? Yes, uh, his name is Chris. I Chris, guess. so thank you, Chris, for being such an amazing ally. What an incredible <laughs> and patient person oh Chris is. You have no idea. <laughs> oh, my goodness. The, the way that you talk about him in the book, just kind of peppering little, peppering little, oh, but if they really had your best interests, uh, at heart why why would they stop you from spending the holidays with us mm -hmm. and that's it and that's all I'm going to say and I'm not going to push you any further yeah and and I'm not going to force you to confront anything I'm just just going to throw that out there and just leave it <laughs> oh my goodness we need so many more Chris's in the world because I'll tell them I, so. <laughs> I feel like I feel like so many people have have tried to crack the best way to communicate yeah with with the with a victim with with victims of of various cults and and high demand groups and there is no perfect method but what chris did and his patience was just so incredible and every time you mentioned just a little thing that he did i was thinking yeah go chris because <laughs> it eventually you know it worked and, and because we wouldn't be sitting here talking yeah. today and of course a lot of the work uh that came from it you had to do but he yeah. did kind of little gentle nudges in that direction um so yeah. you join 
your your life has changed significantly you Mm -hmm. you are firmly in school you're firmly doing the work what what changes I've, I've spoken to so many people that say I should have just left after a year because it was utopia for a year Kerry Noble talks about it when he yeah. talks about the covenant the sword and the arm of the Lord which became a an extremely far-right extremist religious sect that had racist views and actually tried to commit mass murder through the bombing of of lgbtqia plus friendly churches and he ended up being the the co-leader of of the csa um and he is just such an incredible author and voice and his journey is wild but he says if i would have just left after two years i could say that i experienced utopia and that would have been enough for me but i i didn't i stayed I ignored the red flags, I ignored the warning signs, and things got really bad. Yeah, it sounds like he was in call to darkest, <laughs> you know, the, the worst of the worst. Um, but, you know, I feel like the time frame is about right. Like, if I had left after a year, I would have been like, had this experience, now I'm, you know, in a relationship, it was a wonderful experience, I'll take the tools with me. Um, um but I stay because the longer you stay in a cult, the more dependent you feel upon it. And I was afraid that I would lose all of this alleged progress if I left. And um, I would say two years in, I was actually pretty miserable. And this was like, there were many job losses. I'll put it that way. It's too long of a... <laughs> a chapter to get into but like let's just say that the job that I got that I was so thrilled about in the beginning didn't work out so well and then there was another job after that that didn't work out so well you know um and um you know so I don't know you know maybe two years in I I I lose one job or another I start another job um by the way over the course of time in my personal life You know, my grandma dies. My dad gets very, very sick. Um, My dad died in 2009. Um, So the, and and, uh, there were just several like kind of personal life dramas that were in the background, you know? In fact, I feel, and I don't know if this is true, but I feel like the group was a little easier on me than it was on other students because I was going back and forth between like going to see my grandmother in Florida before she died and then going to Ohio where my dad was, you know, they were, I think, trending, treading a little bit softly with me than they did with other students. Um, um, so 06 to 08, I got married in 09. I think after I got married, it was like all bets were off. I mean, the, all the love bombing stops, right? And at that point, I'm extremely dependent emotionally on this group. I feel like I can't, I can't, you know, I, I don't mean to be crude, Casey, but I almost felt like I can't even wipe my ass without asking how to do it. You know, like it's that bad, right? And the, um, the cognitive dissonance was so fucking loud at that point. So along with a book, I have also written something that will, I hope one day become either a one woman show or like a mini musical. Okay. There's me, there's my, um, inner skeptics who are like, what the fuck are you doing? You know? And then there's the starry eyed believers. And there was a constant debate going on in my mind. And, you know, needless to say, the longer I stayed in school, the more crazy I felt and the less functional I became. Right. And then, of course, it was always my fault that I was so dysfunctional. (laughs) If only I tried a little harder. Um, So. um, (laughs) So, So, yeah, the people Uh, like the people listening won't be able to see. But there's just me kind of like with my hand over my (laughs) eyes, just kind of hiding away from. (laughs) I can confirm that that is true. Um. (laughs) There's there's a few things that, that you've said there that I feel are important to highlight. Um, first of all 
it's the it's the fact that you've had then these these uh losses um and and this upheaval in your life where you feel extreme grief but then even in terms of talking about the the group you you've mentioned that you had all of these things happening in the background um which it speaks volumes to the fact that you weren't able to have the death of a loved one as something that is your primary focus at that time how does how does that become what I mean we're we're talking about how that becomes possible um and then you feel like the group may have been slightly more lenient on you because of those things that that were happening and I should hope so, because if they pushed you any further at that point, there could have been some serious ill mental health repercussions that that that, that came from that. Um, and and I we have heard about those things happening on the show before. Mm-hmm. But it's 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 one thing to have to experience grief in your life. It's another thing. And 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 I I don't know if this is an accurate um an accurate take from what you've said, but Mary Mahoney, when she talked to me about her experiences in the Children of God and her memoir, Abnormal Normal, My Life in the Children of God, she talked about how her mum and dad passed away and she felt guilty about spending time thinking about them or spending time thinking about mourning them or trying to mourn them or secretly and silently mourning them because she couldn't do it outwardly in the children of God because that's her grief is is not for God and everything that she does should be for God so um the death of her father or the death of her mother it it, it would be self selfish for her to mourn um somebody that she was um so close to when she was growing up so I don't know if you felt like guilty for for having these experiences in your life and how they may have taken some of your attention away from the group and how you were thinking I need to get back there because I have responsibilities within the group how how did that feel for you at the time well, you know, it's interesting because it, I didn't, I think, you know, there's, there's a way in which, you know, I was having the cognitive dissonance in us, particularly when my dad was in hospice, I was like, fuck everything else. I didn't care and feel an ounce of guilt. The, the school was actually support, very supportive of me at that point. Um, you know, I was getting phone calls every day from a teacher, like, how are things going? She'd talk to me, she'd listen, you know, there was still like the love bombing quality. It wasn't that harsh. I mean, that's just heinous that this person couldn't mourn her parents. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, there's some heartbreaking accounts that have come from, from interviews around that particular group. Horrible group, horrible group. Um, you know, I saw other people though, who were in school longer, for example, um, in my first Christmas party, which we haven't talked about, you know, yet, and I, I realized that we've already been talking for a long time, so we may not get to it, but let's just say that every, every holiday season school threw a party, which meant we were throwing the party, and that was very um, intricate and time-consuming, and it was basically a hijacking of holiday season from your family, you know, um, but there was, I think this was my very first year one of the people, one of the other students, her father went into the hospital and she missed a lot of work sessions. And um, I, as a young student, and I have never forgotten this, this is cognitive dissonance. This is where my inner skeptic started saying, there's something wrong with this. <laughs> you know, I, I saw one of the teachers taking the student to task for missing work sessions. And I was like going, that's weird. And, but what befuddled me more is she said to him, I don't want you to give up on me. Oh, that's so heartbreaking. and awful? That's so sad, isn't it? Yeah. And even in my coma, I was like, why is she saying that? Her father's in the hospital. So perhaps at that point, she could be experiencing what Mary spoke about when she felt guilty about wanting 
or needing yeah. to grieve the death of her parents um, yeah. she this this particular person has a very ill parent and they are spending time with them and they're worried about how that might implicate their position in this group isn't that awful that is really yeah another example is um there was a, another classmate whose father died I think it was after mine. It was after mine because I was very like um, identified, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was relating to her, right? How dare you? Uh, I know it's terrible. Um, her father died, and you know, in in our class, we would get up and ask for help, and she got up and asked for help because, of course, she was grieving and she was crying a lot. And um, I heard, this is like a, a rare, courageous moment that I had where Robert started calling it self-pity. And I remember <laughs> getting up, you know, like a good student. I stood up and waited to be called on, but I was like, um, her father just died. Don't you think she, of course she's crying. Of course she's sad. And again, Casey, she defended him. Oh, okay. It was, was kind of like, you know, I, I need, I, you know, I, at this point it's self-pity and, you know, and I, I, Robert's helping me. You don't understand because you're a younger student. <laughs> at that point, I was still considered a younger student because I think they knew that my toe was always out the door. <laughs> that is so interesting that that was the there's still that level of superiority in such a moment of crisis and vulnerability yeah. and, and someone coming to her defense or perhaps it's because she feels em embarrassed by somebody coming to her defense after Robert has said, this is self pity. Yeah. And she's thinking, who am I to question Robert? But then that also reminds me of a lot of situations you see around domestic violence and domestic abuse. When one person um it is being abused by a, a spouse or a partner and and then somebody from the outside comes in and tries to take that person out of the situation and the person being abused will actually either act out physically or verbally um and, and say you know don't don't get involved in my situation that's not a, an uncommon uh, thing to see I, I don't think in those particular situations yeah. and and there's a lot of similarities between uh domestic abuse cases and and cults and cult-like methods of control and you know there are one-on-one -on -one cults that do exist so maybe they're one in the same I'm not an expert but maybe I should ask Yanya what she thinks about that well I you know honestly I think they are the same I think abuse is abuse I you know the cycle is the cycle it's, it's the same. It's like in one case, it's a one-on-one. -on -one, in another case, it's a group, this group pathology that's playing out, you know? And how does Chris react to this? Because I, I, if it's such a secret society, I mean, how much are you allowed to tell him? How much does he know? You said after your first meeting, you were like, listen to what this guy's been telling me doesn't this sound strange and your friend's like yeah I would run um, and you're like yeah I might stick around a little while longer but, but I mean have you had the same approach with Chris or does he kind of think that you just meet with a group of people and you read from a study book yeah. on Tuesday nights let me let me clarify a couple things one is I didn't have that conversation with my friend until after I left like I didn't, right okay I, I didn't I didn't tell anyone except Chris anything Wow. So, okay. My friends, my family, nobody knew anything. They knew that I wasn't as available. <laughs> and then when, when I started like becoming, um, like mentally ill, I will call it that, you know, I had friends who were like, I'm worried about you. What the hell's going on? Right. Um, but Chris, um, in the beginning, when we first started dating, Oh, let me rewind a little bit, Casey, you know, it, in the kind of, most um pure um following of this rule that you don't talk about school because it's the invisible world you wouldn't tell your spouse okay um i broke that rule early on and, and told chris like i go to this thing every tuesday and thursday night and um it was very like very early like 
you know, maybe like a third date or something. And um, his response was, well, if this thing helps you, that it's not my business. I can't, I'm not going to try to control you or tell you what to do, you know. If you think it's helpful, like he's trusting me, I'm a grown up, right? Um, and um, so we used to call it Tuesday, Thursday thing. Like I'd be like, I'm going to thing tonight, I'll see you after, you know? <laughs> um, and of course, at first it didn't take up as much time. You know, it was just a, twice a week I would go. Um, but then the holiday season came. And every year we fought more, you know, not only do these groups exploit the members, they take advantage of the, me the members support system, you know, like our real support system is going to be like, I want to, you know, if this thing's helping you, I'm going to, I'm going to support it. I'll, you know, I'll help you continue. I'll, I'll help you pay for it. I mean, I was using our money to pay for this. Right. Um, so, so at first, you know, I, he knew very little. He knew that I was going to this thing. He knew that I wasn't supposed to be talking about it. He trusted me that I wasn't in a cult. <laughs> and then holiday seasons started getting worse and worse. And then he started calling it a cult every once in a while when angry, which, you know, I'm sure that you can understand, right? <laughs> um, but you're right. He was very judicious in the way that, and smart in the way that he would push me and not push me. And, um, and then every once in a while he would try to find information. He would do searches online. And then, you know, we finally, at the end, I, I honestly can't, I feel like, like, honestly, I do feel like I have a guardian angel. I mean, for whatever reason, his timing, when he found information on, on the internet, after years of looking um, and was able to confront me, like I found these websites, I was ready to blow a gasket. I was about to either leave or lose my mind. So um, it was at first she was like, I'm hands off, you know, and then it was like our holiday season suck because you're never here and that sucks, you know. Um, and then... Um, and then there was him dropping the cult bomb, you know, as time went on. Um, and then he finally confronted me, you know, with, I found this information online. I looked at your checkbook. I can't remember everything I put in, but, oh, and I'm really worried about you. You're losing weight. You can't sleep. You know, you're depressed. Um, you can't find a job, you know, like. Um, and and he, he was very clever in asking you questions that weren't rhetorical uh, for you to take away and think about it. things like um, you're spending a lot more time with school and you're more uh, distant uh, or you're more stressed or you're more anxious or you seem more depressed. Do you think that maybe they could be connected? And he, it, it, it never seemed to come from a place of, of malice. It never seemed to come from a place of judgment. It just was generally like a, you know, I'm seeing that there could be some kind of connection here. What do you think? Yeah. And and if you were like, I can't talk about this right now. I've got like parties to plan and I've got pe <laughs> people to recruit and voicemails to respond to. Like, okay, yeah, no, no, that, that's okay. That's, that's okay. Well, we can talk about it later. Um, yeah. But you... even what you've just said there, your relationship came under significant strain more and more and more as your involvement with school became more and more and more um so that speaks for itself but yeah. even even on your first few dates where you're like so I go to this thing <laughs> you know, on Tuesdays and Thursdays even then it's almost like you're admitting to yourself and to him that it's a little bit dodgy um because well, I can't tell you anything about it so I know that it's weird uh but that's where we'll leave it so it's almost right. like from the start you're at, at admitting to him without telling him that you know that that's what it is yeah um, there's, there's something's wrong you know clearly there's something weird going on here it's it's interesting that you said that you were ready to leave him in the end because um 
if the responses that you were getting from your sustainers and from leadership at that time was kind of pushing you into that being the only option that you had was that your husband is the problem you you need to leave your husband um and and the it, the book itself as well it's like it feels stressful at that time because you're like that one person's telling me this and then my husband's telling me this and then I'm being told this and then I feel this way but I also feel this way but then what if this happens and it's like all of these things are going around so we kind of all really feel like we're in that headspace with you at that time Um, and it kind of does feel confusing like even with the podcast work if I have too much to do or I've given my, my I give myself these deadlines so why do I get so stressed yeah. so I give myself these deadlines and then I have all these things that I want to do or all of these things that I have to do in air quotes because I don't have to do anything <laughs> and I feel like I'm walking around in really thick fog and yeah. there's there's so many things around me that I can kind of see the outline of them, but I can't quite make out exactly what they are. Mm-hmm. And I walk around in this fog sometimes, knowing that I have all of these things that I want to have done by a certain time, but not knowing exactly what those things are, how to start them, when to start them. I have creative ideas that I think will be really good that come to me just as I'm about to fall asleep. And they're kind of in the fog somewhere. Yeah. So goodness knows how it feels to be systematically coerced and manipulated to purposefully feel that way so that you can't have any thoughts or come to the conclusion of anything at all. This is the end of part one. Part two is available to listen to right now.